did you mention that you you did find you know in the other skeleton players and maybe even in yourself mm -hmm. um this sort of psychological issues going on yeah especially yeah. during or maybe after yeah and so we have this new york times article that's pulled up mm -hmm. and i mean i myself i have always will be i've been like a high strung person yeah you don't seem it though you know you calm cool and <laughs> so collected cool. I'm so cool <laughs> now i've like burned myself out um you know i've always been very motivated but i, I never had any anxiety around like movement or driving but then after the concussions i developed like intense fears during driving right if i was driving i yeah. was fine right. if i was a passenger i'm your worst nightmare well who was driving though well yeah I know, that's, that's a good point but like even even now yeah. Yeah, even yeah. now i'm a pain but yeah. like it was this panic experience because it just felt like with lights coming at me like i couldn't manage the information right. and it caused this intense anxiety response and it just felt like i was crashing all the time yeah. Um, without any input yeah. and so that got extremely bad in the year after i retired yeah. um and it's something that i've really honestly dealt with ever since but now like i can keep my mouth shut and like not not grasp the it took the, a phd <laughs> yeah it took a while in sports neuropsychology <laughs> for you to figure it out so i, I what i'm it, a lot of people don't have that luxury right yeah, that's having, right having the insight that you do and a lot of people are experiencing like anxiety like the anxiety disorders and depression right. after retiring but we don't know how many is the problem is it's all anecdotal again yeah, right we're yeah. we're launching this study through ucla and through um you know some uh, some other collaborators around the world who are tied to the sport to help understand some of that to right. just get some basic lay of the land of right. how many people are really struggling with these things yeah. after uh sliding sports like bobsled yeah. luge and skeleton yeah. um, but you know the new york times articles that have been coming out recently have really uh you know, laid bare that it, there may be a similar phenomenon that uh, that there's there's mood disorders that are occurring that are leading to in some people really sad awful outcomes. Right. Um, You've mentioned that some people have actually committed suicide that were uh, that yeah, were skeleton folks. Uh, bobsled, bobsled are the sorry. ones, but yeah. um, you know, and it's so hard to to disentangle because is it depression because of loss of identity from coming out of being an athlete right. and retirement right. there's a whole we know that there's a lot of depression that can come with athletes in that experience there's a lot of depression in athletes in general that mm -hmm. can happen um the weight of gold dived into that a lot but it also hid, ha highlighted the journey of steve holcomb who was an amazing bobsledder mm -hmm. who who died not from suicide but you know had been struggling with mood mood difficulties mm -hmm. Um, so is there a component of brain injury that's contributing to those things coming out and being too overwhelming? Right. And then when, when you think about, um, you know, you, you think about it in the context of football, right? Cause there's just so mm -hmm. much, um, it's such a hot button topic, topic right now mm -hmm, with football mm -hmm. and it's so, like, you're right. It's so complicated, right? Cause you leave football, you lose this identity. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about it on the other episodes with, um, with Earl, this like loss of identity, Right. And at the same time, is there sort of this brain injury component to it? Right. Right. And then, um, you know, and then you have these these sort of psychological issues that happen secondary to that. Right. Right. So like me, I came out of my injury and uh, tr tried eventually to like go back into to work and was like uh, doing some research, um, volunteering. And I started struggling with numbers a lot, like yeah. adding things that I felt like I shouldn't be struggling with. But at the same time, I hadn't been doing math for right. <laughs> like three years in the same way that I was doing it again after after my sports career was over. So was it deconditioning just because I hadn't been doing math and right. just doing that on a regular regular basis? Right. Or what and it, what it felt like to me was that I had lost something. Right. And then, then there, there's the issue that you can't really focus well and do math well if you're in pain right. and you're anxious right. and stressed. Right. So all of these things are interacting to produce difficulties. Right. But I, you know, I do think that there's a role of brain injury that we have to understand better right. especially in this sport i mean you watch the the video and yeah. you're like oh you don't get nothing from that right. it, yeah absolutely it's and pretty violent I'm, I'm so glad that you pointed that out because 
right now, especially people that have been involved in contact sports or any mm-hmm. sort of sport like yourself, mm-hmm. you know, there's always bi- the big three letter words like CTE, yeah, right? Like yeah. th- that's always jumped to, right. and a lot of people, and some people have it, right? And it's awful and it's really terrible and, you know, so mm-hmm. on and so forth. Um, but some people don't have it, right? But attribute all their symptoms to CTE when in fact, you know, like you mentioned, it could be, you know, uh, deconditioning, right? The mm-hmm. anxiety that mm-hmm. might or might not be related to the, to the to the trauma, right? But yeah. nonetheless, it is contributing to, you know, difficulty focusing and so on and so forth. When I came out of Skeleton is really when that that first paper um, by Omalu and all them started gaining a lot of media attention about CTE. Right. And um, I was really terrified. Yeah. I was terrified. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I've ruined my brain. Right. I'm having all these issues. I'm, you know, maybe I'm going down a dementia route. My grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's around right. that time. And so all of that pressure interacted with what was going on. Like, right. you don't exist in a vacuum. Right. I was really scared. But then the more that I spent time in the PhD and understanding, you know, pathology yeah. and, and the trajectories and understanding more about dementia itself, right. I started to realize that. It, there's probably a very low chance that I would have anything like that. Right. And it, there's no consensus around what it is. Yeah. And the the trajectories to getting to CT are so complex. Right. I, I just like, I can't predict that about myself. Right. And it would just become a self-fulfilling prophecy for me. Yeah. And so by learning a, about it more and becoming more functional and engaging more with my world through work, through exercise, those fears started to subside right. and I'm able to li- live a life that's not haunted. By participating yeah. in life and not letting see C- the idea of possibly having CTE like sort of tie you down and weigh you down, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I think like as human beings, we are always looking for an explanation for the world around us mm-hmm. and what we go through and what we feel. And um, I think we typically lean on um, the idea of Occam's razor, right? Where it's mm-hmm. like, what, what's the easy? What's one thing that can explain everything that's happening? Yeah, right. And CTE is a is a really good concept of Occam's razor that can explain everything, right? Mm-hmm. It can, but then there, and it always breaks my heart when I see patients who really believe that they have dementia. And you know we can we can test that we can examine them and right. and they don't and they've right. you know there's there's some other component that's contributing to most of it and their lives have been really structured around this belief that they're not going to live right. and it's it's really sad and um, it is weird right because I, I've been in that situation before mm-hmm. really intense situations like that and it's so like counterintuitive right like dude dude, i'm telling you good news mm-hmm. right like you you don't have cte the reports show it you you know your your comprehensive neuropsychological exam shows it you don't have cte mm-hmm. but but people process it, like they don't process it well like you know what i mean like they're not happy about it mm-hmm. not at that moment at least yeah and then it's hard to know what to do next right and there's always that doubt about cte like maybe the doctors are wrong there's not a right. good consensus you don't know and it's it's yeah. a really hard place to be, but I know for my personal journey, um, learning more about it and like getting, you know, getting my PhD in this right. was my way out of a lot of what I was struggling with. Yeah. So and then the idea of these subconcussive mm-hmm. that is that is why probably one of the main reasons that I that I wanted to have you on because uh-huh. that like in in like in the a subtopic of an already like really hot button topic right now of concussion is mm-hmm. subconcussive injuries right, right like right. for example you know um high school girls or just high school athletes in general not not girls because uh, but girls are predisposed to concussion in soccer more so than men right mm-hmm. but just in general is like heading the ball right is yeah. am i getting these sort of accumulation of subconcussive injuries right right, right. that then you know is going to are going to lead to you know a degenerative uh degenerative disease or so on and so forth there's no consensus out on the the impact of subconcussive injuries right, right now right. right yeah but nonetheless there's something there <laughs> like there's like a, I, yeah I freaking know it, right? Like, you know, like, as a professional, like, you know mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. but there's just, but there's just, we don't know. 
but we, you know what I mean? Like you have that hunch as like a, a healthcare professional. And there's, there's some, you know, there's data now from the, the large scale, the NCAA study that's right. coming out, you know, showing with helmet sensors and things like that, but it's just not a binary yes or no. But that, that's yeah. what people want. Right. P- tell me yes yeah. or no. Right. Yeah. And I, it, we're in a situation right now, right. Where People are looking for answers, but I can't just definitively give you an answer, right? Mm-hmm. So, and in my in my career, you know, I'd have I've had runs that were really awful, like awful runs right. where like I'd come out bleeding, and I wouldn't, and I'd be fine, right? Well, fine, right. you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't have the same kinds of uh, fogginess, and then I'd have runs where I thought that they went really well. And would start to become symptomatic afterwards. Right. And that's the thing. This sport points to, like, you can't ignore. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone says, uh, you know, oh, it's anecdotal data, right? Yeah. Oh, it's anecdotal, it's anecdotal, it's anecdotal. Like, and then, you know, when does it not become anecdotal, right? Like, I don't mm-hmm. know. But I do appreciate the fact that some things are just anecdotal. But I think that labeling them anec- anecdotal doesn't mean you ignore them, right? Mm-hmm. And and you don't... You have to look at right? it. You, you, have ha- to you have to look at it, right? In and a systematic way. I think yeah. that, you know, um, your your case and the case of um, um, the skeleton, right, mm-hmm. is like, to me, a prime example of these sort of like sub-concussive impacts that accumulate over time. It's kind of a perfect example. It's a of perfect example an and one that I wish it. you wouldn't have given, but one that nonetheless <laughs> is there, right? Because yeah. like... The reason that I'm that I'm saying that is because, you know, as like a, as a doctor, as anybody, right? You want to have the answer. You want to say, oh, concussion, not concussion. You, you know, need this many concussions to develop CTE, but there's nothing like that, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just such a gray area. And then you come along with, you know, this whole skeleton story that it's like, and I remember the first time I heard it was earlier this year and I was like, oh probably subconcussive, just the accumulation mm-hmm. of subconcussive injuries, right? Yeah. Causing you to have symptoms. Nobody had words for that at that point, like, or it just, it wasn't in, on the discussion table. But you're, the way yeah. you describe it is I had a concussion at the end of my run. And I had to say it that way, but because nobody would understand, being like, what's wrong with you? Like, go back out. Right, right. And that was part of the problem is because there's this ambiguity around subconcussive impacts that all the you know other athletes, the coaches, the athletic trainers that were around would be like, well, you didn't have a big hit. Right. Like, keep going. I just want to, because I, te- I, I think in our society, there's always an overcorrection for stuff. Like yeah, a, a that's way a good overcorrection, right? Yeah. You don't only see that in concussion, you see it in everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, we can say, yeah, subconcu- you know, subconcussive injuries might exist, right? Um, but it's just such a gray area because now I've been hearing about people thinking that they have CTE after, you know, jet skiing for this, mm-hmm. ma- you know, so many years, right? All mm-hmm. that rattling back and forth. And like, you know, if we're going to get to that point where folks aren't jet skiing or, you know, I've heard riding, uh, drive, uh, driving their car off road. Oh, yeah. Right. I, I did that a lot. Am I going to develop CTE? Mm-hmm. Right. And fact of the the data isn't out there on that yet, right? Mm-hmm. So this this overcorrection where people are worried about jet skiing and off you know off roading, right? I think it's a little bit of an overcorrection at this point. Mm-hmm. And, the, right? and the thing that you have to do is listen to symptoms, right? But when symptoms are so nonspecific, right? it's a, exactly. it's a really hard, very nonspecific hard thing to do. So yeah, I'm hoping with this study that we're launching that we'll be able to uh, at least better understand some of those dynamics because we have questions about. Uh, that, that kind of get at subconcussive effects. Yeah, so yeah. Um, the answer is always more research. <laughs> more research. I, I agree. I mean, that's the only way for it to transition from anecdotal to established, I mm-hmm. think, right? Mm-hmm. So there seems to be, uh, um, before when you were competing, it wasn't really talked about. Now there's increased awareness. New yeah. York Times put out an article. Right. What year was that in? Uh, so, you know, you remember? I, I remember fe- seeing an article about the Canadians women's team, you know, maybe like four or five years after I quit. And I was like, ah, like, look, it's not just me. Right, I thought it was right. just me. Like everybody made me feel like there was something like wrong with me. You. Yeah, <laughs> I was the, I that was the issue. And they were having the same problems. And, I, you know, in the past, I think three years, uh, there's been a whole series of articles by the New York Times really diving into some of the bobsled, the, the suicides, and particular athletes' journeys with really struggling with symptoms that are accumulating over time. Right. So uh, 
there's there's pressure now that is being talked about to figure out how do we address this in the sport. Yeah. So do you want to pull up do you want to pull up the article just sure, real quick? Sure. Sure. Yeah, so this is one of the most recent ones that came out, and this is about Ellie Furno, uh, who was a really promising athlete, but she experienced the same kinds of things that I did. You know, she would come out of the track and feel extremely like wiped out, and then it would evolve over time, and she just being feeling fried and frazzled. She said, right. um, but then continuing to go back because you, the way that she frames it, it's not again a very clear injury. That you can point to and say, oh, right, you know, you're right, that hit out right. of 13, you should probably sit it out. So, so she's coming back and continuing to train, and there's not like a recovery, uh, return to play process at right. all. And, it, yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and let's just re wiped out her brain so fried and frazzled after a run that she could not endure another. For no, would sleep it off and come back the next day to do it all over again. Because that is all that she wanted, and no one told her to stop. Yeah. Yeah. So that was. That was my experience. Yeah, that's your experience. That was my experience. Too. <laughs> I think you were quoted in this too, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, briefly. Somewhere in there. Yeah. 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 Um, it's just available on on Google on the Google, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's just, just Google New York Times. Yeah, as me, I think my one little quote is about we need more research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Um. And you know what? A return, uh, and we we're talking about this. A yeah, return yeah. to, a return to play protocol, right? Mm -hmm. Which is when someone's had a concussion, they're outside of the, you know, they're kind of outside of the, the, you know, repeat damage period, which is usually about a month, maybe sooner, depends on symptoms. Um, where you have a uh, return to play, which you basically slowly reintegrate the athlete back into their full activity mm -hmm. by just kind of uh, going up by levels. Yeah. And skeleton bobsledding is like a perfect thing to do that, right? Somewhat. There's like some big jumps. And I, I think that's been one of the issues is that nobody really, ha it, as far as I know, there's not a clear defined protocol for how to do that yeah. or suggestions about how to adapt that because yeah. it, it feels like such an all or nothing kind of sport. So um, I think that's that's something that the Federation should really look at. Yeah. And and yeah. Um, it's, it's going to be worthy because a lot of, international governing bodies are implementing the kind of return to play. And so like the whole problem is why is the governing body doing this? Why do we care? It's because the athlete is not going to do it. Ellie Furno, me, right. all these other athletes, you're under so much pressure. And you shouldn't have to. Yeah. Right? Like you, sh you shouldn't be responsible for your own concussion care, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with, you know, international federations, right? Olympics, yeah. different things like that. If you're in an organized sport, right, where mm -hmm. you're competing – and that's all you're worried about. You should not be worried about this concussion, that concussion. Did I have a concussion? Did I not? You should just do your job, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. and trust that the whatever organization it is that you're a part of is going to make sure that you're all right and look out for you. And, right? because you, and you also may not even know. Right. You know, you may not even be able to advocate and make decisions accurately because of the effects of the concussion. Right. For me, they evolved over days. Right. So if you had asked me five, ten minutes after my run, when the adrenaline's pumping, yeah. do I feel okay? I feel like, yeah, I feel great. That's or, a great point. I feel That's a little off. That's a fantastic off, point. You know? We have a lot of that, right? Where like a football player has a concussion in the second quarter. They won't have symptoms till mm -hmm. after the game. Yeah. Right? And you know, we don't know yet. We can theorize why that happens, but right. pretty certain it has a lot to do with the sympathetic nervous system and all that adrenaline running through, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, uh, supplying that blood flow to the brain where it might be restricted. It changes you know. how your brain pays right. attention to right. things, not not willfully, right. just like right, right, right. Exactly. consciously. That's a great point. Yeah. So that, that's, that's, you know, where I see is that in this sport can be made safer, um, in the long run is by looking at have you got have do. you gotten pushback from the governing body some go well there's national governing bodies and there's international governing bodies and okay. like, um like israel is really motivated to do uh just because i know them personally right, and, and right. they've had me on board to talk to their athletes and things like that so like they take this very seriously sure but you know there's not it's hard to implement a guideline when it doesn't come from the the very top or that it's not it's adopted right. um inconsistently right. and a lot of the athletes are just distributed throughout the world it's yeah. there's you know, it's very much an international sport. Right. So, um, 
uh, hopefully we'll start seeing some hopefully. changes. Yeah. Yeah. More research. More, re- more research. <laughs> always more research. So there's. So here's your quote. I'm, I might as well read it out. Uh, okay. What causes the? Is this you quoting this? You, uh, this is. Asking, they ask you for a quote and you're like asking we, we questions. Had a, we had a whole conversation. Uh, okay. So yeah. <laughs> what causes the injury? <laughs> are they more common at certain tracks or or after a certain number of runs? Said Aliyah Snyder, a former skeleton athlete who became a neuropsychologist at UCLA, yeah. following years of struggling with concussion-like symptoms after she left the sport. Snyder is now working with McCarthy and Wood to make the sport safer. Only then can we try to figure out the correct protocols. Yeah. So we need to know what the risk factors are for yeah. people having these persistent symptoms. We need to know, are they following them after right. they're, they're retired? We need to know a lot of information because we don't want to make a recommendation that alienates the community and it is in not adopted. Right. It has to be based on what's actually happening. Right. So that's that's where we're at. We're at the beginning of that journey, our slide safe journey, as we yeah. call slide it. Slide safe? Slide safe. That's a, that's Yeah. Rolls off the tongue well. It's not bad. So, yeah. um, what's the what's the study? The study is we are um, about to launch a survey okay. for all skeleton, luge, bobsled athletes um, ages seven and above. So anybody that's ever participated in the sport and a competitive level mm-hmm. uh, to help us understand their medical histories, their symptom history, uh, what tracks they've been on. So it's a comprehensive survey. It takes about... 10 to 15 minutes to complete yeah. and it collects information um, that would be help us better understand yeah. these risk factors. That's going to be huge, right? Because yeah. now you're transitioning from anecdotal mm-hmm. people DMing you and, and texting you and whatnot to yeah. actual like survey data. That's going to be huge. Because it's if it's only like 10 people right. who are actually experiencing this right. then maybe there's something about those 10 people right. that we need to look right. at but if it's a if it's a large but portion I think, then I we think need you to know look. it's not just 10 people my, mm. my gut is not mm. but I'm a good scientist yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. maybe I'm, I might not be so much because <laughs> I just I go off my hunches but yeah. Listen, it was so good to have you on. Thank you. Fun so to good. talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I've only met you via all our Zoom meetings, but I it's know. so so nice to have you on. Um, and I love what you're doing. Thank you. I love you. what you're doing. Yeah. You are um you're raising the flag, man. You're letting everyone know what's going on and uh, it's great work. So well, thank you for the platform and thank you for having these conversations. I, ho- I hope somebody out there f- finds it. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Helpful, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure everyone's going to find it interesting. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is episode number three of the UCLA Brain Sport Podcast. We had an amazing guest on. You're setting the tone for the rest of these episodes. I'm so excited. Uh, my name's Adele, sports neurologist at UCLA Brain Sport. Contact me if you want. You can contact the clinic if you guys have any questions or. Um, you feel that you might be having some similar symptoms, some similar experiences to something that Aaliyah just, uh, just talked about, call the clinic, set up an appointment. We'd be happy to see you. Everybody, thank you.